Uh, hey there, I am Daisy War, and uh, I have written a book called In the Crypt with a Candlestick. It comes out backwards on the screen, nobody knows why, but some people do. And when I read, it looks like I'm reading backwards, but I'm not. Uh, I'm just going to read a couple of pages. Uh, it's a it's a who done it, um, a bit quite a jokey who done it. Not 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 nothing too gory. It's about uh, posh people in a posh house in modern day killing each other, but only in in a nice way. All right, I hope you enjoy it, and I hope uh, it uh, it lightens your lockdown for the for the few minutes that I'm reading it. All right, uh, chapter one, Toads of Toad Hall. Ready, steady, go. Lady Toad stood by the great north door of her important house, a vision of slimness and grief as she watched her husband take leave of the building for the last time. It was raining, as it always was, and Sir Egbert was dead. At the far end of the park, with its huge high dome obscured by mist, the Toad family maus mausoleum stood waiting, as it always had, to swallow his grim remains. The mausoleum had been swallowing dead Sir Egbert's for ten generations already, and had been waiting to swallow this one since the day of his birth 93 years ago, which fact seemed, at his extended deathbed, to be a source of great comfort to him. Long after he could no longer recognise his wife or go to the lavatory unaided, he remained coherent and agitated about his final resting place. Was it ready for him? Had everyone understood which shelf he wanted? He didn't want to be anywhere near his uncle Gilbert, homosexualist, nor, God forbid, anywhere near the American. Had they moved the path across the park, sorry, had they mowed the path across the park for the hearse, would they remember to remove the cows from the field along the route? He didn't want the hearse getting butted by the bullocks. Over and over again, Lady Toad had to promise him that all was in order. Yes, my Eggy Peggy, she had to say, we know which shelf you want. Everything is ready, you mustn't worry. But he could never hear it enough. It was as if the mausoleum's mere presence, still standing where his ancestors had plopped it all those years ago, was proof that he had done his bit. The toad mausoleum still belonged to the toads. He could rest in peace. It was in lousy shape, mind you. Non-family members had to wear hard hats and sign waiver forms before they were allowed anywhere near it. There were cracks in the walls and missing tiles on the roof and dry rot and damp rot, and in one of the four underground chambers, each with twenty or more shelves, a disgusting infestation of termites. There were stones that had come loose and crypt fronts that had come off and everywhere signs warning tourists to keep out. Not to mention the addition in 1995 of a Missouri millionaire, the American, who had paid the Toad Hall estate £35,000 for permission to rest his plebeian bones in an empty crypt beside Sir Egbert's great, 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 great grandpa. But no matter what state it was in, or whose bones rested inside, there was no denying the toad mausoleum was something to behold. It was vast. It was preposterous. A building of such staggering importance and beauty that students of architecture came to admire it from all around the world. The name toad meant death in German, as the late Sir Egbert often liked to remind his guests. It was his single joke. Welcome to death hall, he would say. Perhaps this is why the toads of Toad Hall invested so much in the family tomb. Maybe they'd always had an unhappy, an unhealthy preoccupation with the end. In any case, Lady Toad could hardly bring herself to look at the wretched thing. She had hated it from the day she mistakenly became Sir Egbert's bride 54 years ago, when, stepping out of the private chapel from which Sir Egbert's coffin was just now being removed, she had happened to glance at the ma mausoleum, its magnificent dome looming through the mist and the rain, and realised that unless she did something radical and very brave, which was unlikely, bloody thing would be looming at her until the day it was her turn to be slipped onto one of its shelves. All things being equal, that wouldn't be for a while yet. Emma Toad was 21 years younger than the husband she was burying today, still fit and fragrant and very much alive, and after 54 years of dutiful wifedom, longing to hand responsibility for the estate to the next generation and spend more time at her lovely villa in Capri. There were only three clouds on the horizon, Nicola, Egbert and Esme none of whom was prepared for the duties that lay ahead. It was too bad, but if somebody had to do it, Lady Toad had served her time. She had waited long enough. There was going to be an almighty rap after the rape. But first the funeral. <clears throat> Egbert and Emma Toad's children, Nicola, Egbert and Esme, 53, 51 and 49 respectively, had not stayed together under the Toad Hall roof for many years now. There were plenty of reasons for this. Nicola was a passionate socialist. She believed all property was theft, 
and was bitterly ashamed of the house she grew up in and consequently stayed away. Egbert, now Sir Egbert of course, 12th Baronet, was a voluntary guest in a nearby privately owned luxury care home from which he didn't like to spend many nights away and Esme lived with wife and family in Australia. So there were geographical reasons. Mostly though they didn't see each other here or under any other roof because they didn't like each other very much. They had a lot of arguing to catch up on. In the past week, as their father's body lay in state in the chapel at the far end of the house, they had argued without pause through every meal and all the boring bits in between. They'd argued about politics, religion, the name of Nicholas' second pony, what Mrs Carfitzi would be cooking them for dinner, and above all, over every minuscule detail of their father's internment. It turned out, despite Lady Toad's deathbed assurances, that the new style of hearse wouldn't be able to make it across the wet park without skidding, so the family eventually agreed they would load the coffin, eco-cardboard, over which unimaginable squabbling, onto a trailer, and attach the trailer, still more squabbling, not onto Lady Toad's perfectly functional and more appropriate black Range Rover, but onto the estate tractor, which was orange. Orange tractor, dirty trailer and cardboard coffin would then lead a stately cortege the traditional quarter-mile route across the park, starting at the great north door where Lady Toad, family and guests now stood waiting, past the lake, up towards Africa Folly, a slight detour and quite a climb but grand and picturesque, and then on down through the field usually occupied by bullocks to the gates of the mausoleum. Lady Toad would walk immediately behind the trailer, accompanied by her children and followed by everyone else. Well-wishers, of which there were a few, estate workers, domestic staff and tenants, of which there were many, and grievers, of which there were none. Given the length of the walk from Hall to Mausoleum, and it being early autumn in Yorkshire, the almost guaranteed horrible weather, Lady Toad had thought it might be practical to suggest a less formal dress code. Her children, for once united, could not have disagreed with her more. They insisted on everyone dressing smartly because it was what father would have wanted, which was a bit rich. This morning, Lady Toad couldn't help but notice that all three had chosen to ignore the dress code themselves, each one having pitched up in mud-spattered coats grabbed from the boot room at the last minute. Nicola was also wearing a Che Guevara-style red woolen berry to reflect the importance to herself of her politics. Her oldest brother, affectionately known as Mad Egbert, was wearing a pair of boots that weren't even a pair, and Esme, who had small feet, was wearing a women's pair also grabbed from the boot room at the last minute, which were bright pink. In any case, here they were, Lady Toad and her difficult children, amid a crowd of 250 or so respectfully dressed, bitterly cold funeral guests. The tractor was rumbling towards them, and behind it, the coffin, balanced on eight damp bales of hay and adorned with a single wreath of lilies. The message on the card, covered in plastic to stop the ink from smudging, read, For father, jolly good luck from the family. Not very loving, but then, neither was Sir Egbert. You reap what you sow. And I'm going to stop there uh, and uh, hope that you're still there. And... Uh, wish you, sorry my computer's been doing funny things, wish you a uh, happy, you know, a, a smooth lockdown and uh, let's hope it all passes quickly. Thanks for listening and uh, toodle pip. Bye bye.